Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Into Thin Air, Customer Experience Orchestration for the Airline Industry. We're very thankful you've taken time out of your busy day to join us, but before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Today's agenda. Well, we're going to spend the next uh, couple minutes here with the introductions. We'll follow that with 35 to 40 minutes for the actual presentations. And then we'll wrap everything up with 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Now, throughout the presentation, you can submit your questions by using the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen. Also, please follow this conversation on Twitter using the hashtag IntoThinAir. But before we get started, just a little bit about our sponsors. Content Orchestration by .CMS. Now, .CMS allows you to build, deliver, and scale content anywhere and everywhere, from IoT devices, mobile apps, voice assistants, digital signage, smart TVs, or whatever comes next. .CMS is used by Fortune 500 companies, SMBs, and digital agencies alike to future-proof the buyer and the customer experience. And you can learn more about us at dotcms.com and follow us on Twitter at .cms. Now joining us today is international agency DEPT. Now DEPT's an agency of thinkers and makers, uniting creativity, technology, and data, helping reinvent and accelerate your digital reality by creating experiences that people want and businesses need. And now you can learn more about Dept at deptagency.com and on Twitter at Dept Agency. Now today's speakers. I'm your moderator, Robert Slaughter. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at .CMS. And joining me today for our, uh, our presentations be Stefan Schinkel. He's our Chief Sales Officer at .CMS and Dept co-founder Jonathan Whiteside. So let's go ahead and get this thing started and let me turn it over to you Stefan and go ahead and take it away. Take off without any need for engine warm-up. With outside noise now reduced to no more than that of propeller-driven planes. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard the spacious cabin. Attractively decorated, air-conditioned, but draft-free. Newly designed individual overhead light units are an innovation. Roominess extends even to the powder rooms, which look like those in a private home. And a new sensation, complete absence of vibration. Near sonic speed, but inside one of the most stunning discoveries. There is no feeling of movement at all. No vibration, hardly any sound. A new concept in air transportation. The travail has been taken out of travel. Yeah, those were the days. Flying was something magical and marvelous. Air travel exploded into its golden age and airplane trips weren't just a means of getting to your vacation, they were a vacation in themselves. But what an experience. You had insane amounts of legroom, and coach seats had three to six inches more legroom than they do today. And a 1960s economy class uh, looked more like a business class does uh, right now. And first class clearly uh, was about as spacious as a modern uh, hotel uh, room. And then the food, um, with commercial plane travel uh, being a new market, um, airlines struggle to one-up each other uh, by offering the fanciest uh, meals uh, be served in flight. Uh, soup, meat, salad, vegetables, uh, and dessert. Real glassware and uh, roast beef uh, were typical. Uh, you were handed a postcard as you uh, boarded because flying was so utterly rare uh, that passengers felt compelled 
to document every moment on postcards with pictures of the plane or in-flight meals uh, to show their less lucky uh, loved ones what the newfangled experience uh, was uh, like. Uh, unlimited uh, free drinks, right? So alcohol was another popular form of in-flight entertainment. Uh, passengers were served as much free alcohol as they could drink and it was not uncommon uh, to come off a flight uh, totally uh, buzzed. Uh, another good thing, um, you didn't have to show any uh, ID and, and even as late as 1970s, uh, passengers made it onto airplanes uh, without uh, ID of any sort and, and a quick look over uh, from security did the trick. And showing up at the airport uh, 30 minutes before your flight was uh, totally fine and well-wishers uh, could walk right up to your gate uh, where you boarded uh, via stairs and not a jet bridge. And, and passenger screening uh, wouldn't become mandatory until uh, 1970. So quite a different uh, experience uh, from today's uh, average uh, plane trip, right? And air travel uh, has become uh, very affordable and accessible to the larger public uh, and in fact has uh, commoditized. The airline industry is still uh, a very competitive uh, industry and airlines battle for every single uh, passenger and and the number uh, has been growing rapidly between 1970s and, and 2016 as this uh, diagram shows and, and continues to grow uh, going forward. Now the airline industry always has been on the forefront uh, with regards to adopting digital uh, back office activities were moved very quickly uh, to the internet and, and apps and processes like uh, making a booking, checking in, uh, changing a flight uh, were turned into self-service scenarios uh, very rapidly. But what's the destination for the in uh, industry in the next 6 to 12 uh, months? Um, as I mentioned in previous uh, webinars uh, and, and based on research, uh, by Accenture and the World Economic Forum, uh, enterprises can stay ahead of their competition by focusing on three uh, topics uh, when it comes to digital. One, experiences uh, rather than product and services, hyper-personalization, and access-based uh, consumption uh, models. So, so before we go into that, what do people generally do uh, in flight? Um, it's typically a combination of, uh, you know, uh, the following uh, activities. Uh, work, take out your laptop and work. Uh, sleep, eat and drink, maybe one or two meals. Uh, entertainment, you know, watch movies, uh, listen to uh, music, play some uh, games. And, and lastly, you know, socialize, you know, talk uh, to the person sitting next to you uh, or hang out in, uh, in the galley uh, with the flight attendants. Um, so how can we focus on experience and hyper-personalization uh, with regards to these in-flight uh, activities? Now, when it comes to work, um, I basically want to have uh, free Wi-Fi uh, and broadband internet, right? So I think uh, most of the airlines uh, do a pretty decent uh, job there. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, I want to work, so I want to focus, so uh, no distraction and maybe some silence, right? So obviously my noise canceling uh, headset uh, helps uh, out a lot, uh, but I could imagine that you have uh, specific silence spaces uh, in, uh, in an airplane that you can book in advance at an additional uh, premium uh, that I think um, would help for uh, business travelers, right? I mean, uh, we all have that experience uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, a young kid uh, crying uh, for the majority of the, the flight, not a good, setting to focus and uh, 
getting some uh, work done. Um, eat and drink. Um, yeah, what could we do there, right? So what I'm missing here is being able to personalize uh, my meal. I mean, of course, there's a decent variety, typically three uh, meals. Uh, and if you have some uh, uh, restrictions, uh, you can, uh, can choose that as well. But wouldn't it be cool if I can simply, you know, uh, compose uh, my meal uh, online, uh, you know, 24 hours uh, prior to the flight? I mean, if you fly uh, frequently, you would like to have uh, diversity and even uh, pay for this. And um, Air France is uh, uh, started to work with uh, a chef, uh, Daniel uh, Boulou, uh, to basically start this, uh, this experiment. And, and again, uh, I feel that content can uh, make the experience, uh, the total experience here uh, for sure. Um, entertainment, I think most airlines do a pretty decent job here. Uh, you can access your, you know, personal uh, Netflix account. Uh, there's a multitude of uh, movies, games, and, uh, and radio stations that you can listen. Uh, what I don't understand, though, is that uh, you know who I am. Uh, you know where I sit. So why not personalizing uh, the uh, in-flight entertainment screen, right? So I'd rather see uh, this, right? Where you at least welcome me uh, with my, uh, my first name. Uh, those are the little things, but I think they can you know, add to the uh, overall experience. And again, um, you have the data, so why not uh, using it? Um, when it comes to socialize or socializing, um, there is an airline that uh, has taken this to a whole uh, different uh, level. I don't know how popular it is, uh, if they still offer it. I think they do. Uh, but please uh, check out this uh, short video. KLM Meet and Seat a new service to see who else is on board well before departure of your intercontinental flight. Simply connect with your LinkedIn or Facebook account to view other passengers' profiles. Get in touch with interesting people. Meet in reality at the airport. Or during the flight. With Meet and Seat, you can meet other travelers and add interesting new people to your network. Also, after your flight. Make your flight a journey of inspiration with KLM's Meet and Seat. Okay, uh, I'm not sure about this, but it's uh, certainly a nice touch to the... Uh to the travel experience and uh, yeah I think the airline industry has uh, has come a long way and really has made an effort to improve uh, the uh, the travel experience uh, definitely as easy and comfortable as possible uh, at a fair uh, price point and uh, yeah it's still possible to go back to the golden age of flying if you uh, have the money and uh, before I hand over to Jonathan uh, for his take uh, check out the the new first class uh, with the uh, Emirates. Okay, not sure if I want to pay that kind of money, um, but it's good to know that the service level is still there. Thanks, and over to you, Jonathan. Hi, 
My name is Jonathan Whiteside and I am Strategy Director at Debt. Debt is a digital agency of 750 experienced thinkers and makers and we work across offices in the US and Europe. Together, we help our clients reinvent and accelerate their business in today's digital reality. We work across a number of verticals, the large, well-known brands, and a number of them are in the travel and specifically the airline industry. So what are the common challenges that we regularly hear from them? Well, much more than other organisations, airlines are having to balance three big problems. Number one, they have to improve customer experience. But at the same time, they need to increase our revenues and decrease their costs. So by improving um, experiences, really in a digital sense, that's improving the situational awareness to drive personalization, to make things more relevant for their passengers and their, their potential customers. For increasing revenues, it's really about increasing the average order value through sales of extras and ancillary products and to decrease empty seats on planes. And thirdly, for reducing costs is really about operational efficiencies to do more with less. At the same time, the industry is really open for quite large transformation and technological change. Last year, in October, the International Air Transport Association and Airports Council International launched a new initiative called New Experience in Travel and Technologies, or NEXT. With projected traffic growth over the coming years, new on-ground concepts to optimise the use of emerging technologies, processes and design developments are really required. NEXT aims to deliver this future by developing a common aviation vision to enhance the transport experience and guide industry-wide investments and also for government regulations. What the NEXT framework does is it splits um, these initiatives into three main areas, three main sections. Number one is off-airport activities. So it's how technology can be used to create a seamless booking journey to improve travel authorizations and to improve pre and post travel communications and also the journey of our baggages. The second theme is really about uh, advanced processes. Um, so that's in terms of identity management, both of people and of baggage. Cargo automation, cargo is a, a very big thing for a number of airlines, so how do we automate cargo? and how to improve this security screening process and how to make that a little bit more automated, again, both for people and also for baggage and personal belongings. The third theme is around interactive decision-making, uh, baggage tracking and routing, disruption notifications, personalized in-flight options, flight rebooking, cargo monitoring and inspection. These are very big themes which are going to require a lot of effort and a lot of investment over the over the coming uh, number of years to really use the upcoming technologies to the best advantage to improve life for passengers. But what's the need? What's the opportunity? Well, there are some massive opportunities in airline travel coming up over the next twenty years or so. It's expected that the number of passengers in the next twenty years will double or near double, from 4 billion air travellers in 2017 to nearly 8 billion passengers in 2036. Secondly, the advent of larger, more efficient planes allow for longer routes with lower prices, and it's a key trend which a number of airlines are investing in for growth. These new airlines also offer a new passenger experience on board designed to make it more comfortable for people to go places. The thirdly big theme is there's a much wider range of fare choices on offer, from ultra and low cost fare models to super expensive ultra and luxury classes of travel. But one thing, it's never been so easy and accessible for people to fly. 
and this is being seen from the very large increase in passenger numbers. So what can we do differently to change and improve the online digital experience for our passengers? Well, I'd, I'd like to go back once again to the golden age of travel, before websites, before mobile booking engines, back to the start of everyone's airline experience, um, which is when we book tickets. And how we used to book tickets was through travel agents. Travel agents are actually a very important part or were a very essential service uh, back in those days for a number of reasons. Um, number one, for curation and recommendations. A travel agent gets to know the passengers, gets to know their customers, uh, find out their requirements and their preferences, and then make choices and recommendations based on those preferences. Number two is they package flights and ancillary products together. You would go into a travel agent and you not only book the flight, but you would also book your hotel and potentially your car hire and other services that you may need or products that you may need while you're on your vacation or your business trip. It's a very seamless sales experience of multiple products. And actually one of the things that the next initiative is trying to do to make things more seamless in the digital age was actually done very well by travel agents a number of years ago. Number three, travel agents really provided practical advice and guidance based on feedback that they'd had from previous customers. Things like visa advice um, or vaccination advice or where to go, or what to do or where other customers that they have have enjoyed themselves. These are things that you got as an added benefit, a value add by working and buying your tickets through a travel agent. But unfortunately, this model is very manual. Um, and it's not scalable because it's very time consuming. But with new technology, can we actually replicate this level of personalization in the buying experience as we used to get from our travel agents? How did the internet solve the issues um, and the cost issues with all the, the time and scale of all the manual efforts? Well, what we have today is the result of how they tried to fix this. Um, and it was to make the whole booking process self-service, done through a very transactional style internet booking engine. And just a couple of examples. Um, this is what we have today on a flight aggregator or price comparison site, um, this one being Expedia. Very self-serve, you input some data, you hit the search button, and then you get some results back. This is, can also be seen on most airline websites as well. Um, again, same thing, you enter some data, you hit find flights and you get a list of uh, relevant flights back that, hit, that meet the criteria. But you really need to know three things for this to work. In both those ample, examples, you can see that we needed to know the origin, where are we setting off from? Now, in most cases, people know that. Um, so that's not too much of a problem. The second one is destination. You need to know where you're going to. And thirdly, you need to know the dates. You need to know when you're setting off and when you expect to come back. Once you get the results back, you can then filter by other things. You can filter by how many layovers, if you want a layover, how many stops, how many changes, um, time of day, um, the cost, the price. Lots of other factors you can then start to filter on, but you can't get to those filters without first asking or inputting the origin, the destination, and the dates. Sometimes there are actually other questions. Perhaps you don't potentially know where you want to go to. And you might ask some other questions or want to ask some other questions. You might want to ask, do you know what? I want to go somewhere sometime next month, or I want to go somewhere which is less than a four hour fight away, or I don't want to pay more than $250 per ticket, or even a combination of these things. And at the moment, that's not really possible for these interfaces. These questions are far more conversational and a lot less transactional than what we're used to on internet booking engines. These are the sort of questions that you might go into a travel agent and say to them and expect some sort of advice and guidance back. 
We can certainly see how conversational interfaces like chatbots could work. You could easily see yourself typing in, hey, can you find some a fight um, next week sometime uh, within four hours um, to a hot destination or warm sunny, sunny destination? You can see yourself typing that in saying, let's talk and getting some sort of automated response back. Much more conversational way of doing things. But I want to know what else do these questions have in common? And to me, these questions have one thing in common. It's, it's if you're asking these questions, what you want is some inspiration. There's a lot of desire for inspiration because I personally don't think that travel needs to be just a commodity service. The airline and airport experience are often the opening and closing chapters to some of the most memorable experiences that people will have in their lives. It should be exciting. And our digital experiences should, experiences should reflect this and not solely be about transactions and be soulless. So what are the differences in these two approaches between the travel agent personalized experience and the transactional booking engine experience? Well, I think number one is discovery. Um, the first example or the internet booking engine example is very transactional. It's very search orientated. I put in some criteria, I hit the search button, I expect to see some results back. It's not really discovery orientated. And discovery requires two things. It requires curation um, or merchandising, in, a, in, a, in another phrase. And it also requires some sort of personalization or some sort of filtering mechanism. We do see this a lot in the digital world in other industries. We see it in industries where we have interfaces and systems where there are a huge amount of choice and where search is not always the most effective or practical interface. And we can clearly see this in music collections like um, Apple Music or Spotify, where the amount of choice and the catalog of music is so overwhelming that with search only, you'd only ever find what you are looking for. You would never stumble across something that you might actually like, but you don't know the name of. So having curated lists like you do have in Apple Music and Spotify, um, which can be personalized once the system knows who you are and what your preferences are and what your tastes are, really aid that inspiration, that discovery, and it improves the end experience of the customer where there's an element of surprise and delight. It's not just about answering the immediate question, it's also adding some value and adding to the whole experience. We can actually see an example where an airline did even curate their own list uh, or, or playlists on Spotify based on location. So does this work for travel as well, as well as, as the example I showed for music? Well, I think, of course it does, because there's always been travel magazines, there's always been travel columns in newspapers. And what those two things do is they wrap a theme around lists of related routes or fares or destinations. And I think that airlines are in a great position to collate, group and curate these lists of routes and fares. They can create a theme around them, um, around a particular destination or a particular price point or a particular sale that's happening to try and um, get rid of distressed inventory, um, or even look to sell um, in a list higher margin uh, routes or higher margin fares. The choices are really endless. And it gives a great opportunity to tell a compelling story as well and really differentiate against competitors to say, hey, you know, these are the sort of, this is the sort of things that we think about at my airline. Unfortunately, unlike travel agents, we can actually use technology to make this automated and to make it much more personal. So we can actually look to scale the um, travel agent experience. So an example I'm going to go is not from an airline, it's actually from a hotel, but it's very similar. So um, an example is Hilton Hotels, who have created a secondary interface on top of their, uh, their hotel inventory. 
and it allows visitors to explore their hotels across all their brands in the group um, by location, by cities. And it actually just it actually um, challenges uh, visitors to discover, to go, to explore. So I could click on a particular city like Amsterdam, and the first thing I get is actual editorial content. I get images about the city, I get some information about the city, more editorial focus. I also get functionality like maps, which would help me. I get curated um, social media, uh, where the content editors have uh, got photos uh, from Twitter, Facebook, and um, relevant photos for that particular city and curated them onto the page. So really having user generated content. And of course, Hidden, or well not hidden in the page, but located in the page, are promotions to the hotels, which uh, Hilton hotels, which they're trying to sell. But what's the problem with all this? Well, the difficult part is um, all the content. All this content takes a lot of time to create. Uh, it takes a lot of time um, to uh, manage. Um, and it takes a lot of time to publish and distribute. So content is really the big issue here. The hard part is the creation, the composition, to put it onto on-page experiences, to make the experiences work in the different channels and different devices, and to publish. What makes it worse is actually airlines have a huge amount of digital content. And the reason they have a huge amount of digital content is they're operating a number of different websites and a number of different channels. And I call this the multi-problem, where airlines have multiple sites. They might have um, a content site, um, an internet booking site, a cargo site, a loyalty program site, an investor relations site, a recruitment site. Now, some of these do share pieces of content, um, and some of them are specific, but there's a lot of content in a lot of different places for an airline. Multi-country, usually each um, website is um, localized in every country that the airline departs from. Multiple languages, because of the, the nature of, uh, of, of the travel industry, especially airline travel industry, it's necessary to translate and localize um, websites into multiple languages, certainly over five different language variations usually many more than that. And also we have the multi-channel uh, issue where we're publishing to not only web, but sometimes to dedicated mobile apps, to potentially kiosk interfaces. Um, it's possible to publish some content to in-flight um, uh, entertainment systems, information systems. Um, we might want to publish some of our content to third parties so they can use it to help sell our products. And also, um, for marketing reasons, often airlines will create a number of different microsites. So we have our airline content or our, our, our content that we're creating, our editorial content, and it needs to be published and distributed and managed over quite a large number of different digital properties. Of course, an effective way to do this is to implement a content management and um, digital experience management platform to orchestrate all this content management. The benefit being that implementing such systems can help to drive the operational efficiencies which all airlines need to do. How does it do that? Well, number one, it helps to maximize the reuse of content asset, assets. We just went through all those different digital properties that have been managed. The worst case scenario is there would be a single piece of content, let's say a paragraph um, about the airline itself, um, perhaps it's strapline, and it's duplicated in many places across all of those different websites. The ideal situation is we could reuse a single piece of content um, across many different properties, uh, digital properties, and if we update it in one place in the content management tool, it would automatically tell us where it needs to be distributed 
across all these different channels and all these different websites and all these different digital properties. A good digital experience platform should also allow you to repackage a piece of content um, in new and interesting ways. For example, the, the Hilton Hotels example, um, you could see a single product um, hotel or piece of information about a hotel being used in multiple different ways. Um, we can see it being in, um, used on the traditional booking engine focused um, interface, but also the exploration interface, which I, I, I just demonstrated. On an airline, a single piece of content may need to be repackaged in different ways uh, on a website, on an internet booking engine, and on a mobile application. But still, we should be reusing a single piece of content and having different packages in all these different uh, channels. And thirdly, um, a digital experience platform should help um, to orchestrate the distribution of the content across uh, multiple digital platforms. We shouldn't have to rely on IT processes and code releases to get content out there. The system should be allowing business editors and marketing uh, people to publish content and uh, choose which channel, which website, which uh, app um, a piece of content is published to and distribute it immediately across all those different channels. So how? Well, I want to briefly explain how we've been helping implement some technology solutions by maximizing reuse and reducing the time to market for new channels. So what we historically have seen when we've gone into some of our clients is that each one of these channels is siloed into different systems. The page layouts are tied specifically to the CMS and content is duplicated across multiple uh, touch points. It means that creating new channels is lots of effort. So in this example, I have four different channels. I have web, mobile, uh, loyalty websites, and uh, microsites. And each one of these channels has a different content management tool or a different way of managing the content, and usually has different teams. Um, which means if we wanted to create a new channel, it would be a, a brand new silo, a brand new way of doing things in the system, and another duplication. And also in this model, it means that a single piece of content would have to be duplicated across all these different channels because they all have different systems managing them. What we try and do now is to implement um, a system um, which allows to manage a single source of content and maximize reusability. So in which case we would have all editors, all business users updating the content into a single CMS platform. There'd be an API on top, which exposes that content. And then the different channels I would call consumers would just grab the content using the API and display them within their particular channel. It means that the content and the tools to manage the content aren't tied to a particular channel or a particular technology. It also means that new channels are easy to add in the future. We can just add a new channel as long as it can connect to the API and grab content from that API. Then we can start to display up-to-date, uh, accurate content, which is managed centrally by a uh, by the content manager team. We call this approach headless. Um, we call it headless because we have a single um, body which contains all the content, but we don't have any heads attached to the content management system. The heads being uh, the website, the mobile app, the loyalty uh, applications, the Microsoft third parties, those are the different heads. Um, they're not tied to the content management system or the technology platform in any way. Um, so the technology platform itself is called headless. What this allows us to do is start to add personalization and cross-channel personalization to start to dynamically deliver relevant content based on triggers, perhaps browsing behavior, perhaps which uh, channel someone went to uh, looked at, perhaps a record in the CRM system or in a, uh, um, a reservation system. Uh, which tells us something that allows us to personalize. Um, and we can now manage those personalization rules within the digital experience platform. Um, 
having all these rules in the platform allows us to, again, distribute our content through the API in a much more dynamic and relevant way. So to recap, what we um, what we said is that we really wanted to look at, um, at three different things, which are challenges to airlines at the moment. Number one, um, improving the experience. And I hope that showed that allowing passengers to get answers to different questions by using new interfaces, um, such as an inspirational or exploration uh, interface, such as the Hilton one I, did, I demonstrated, um, really allows um, passengers to get to your, or get to the airline's stock and inventory in, in, in new and different ways that perhaps they wouldn't have thought of before. Number two, um, increased revenues is that these new experiences can be used very efficiently to bundle and package all the extras and ancillary services which help to increase the average order values uh, for each customer. It can be much more seamless by having, uh, by rather than thinking about a wizard based internet booking uh, system, uh, which we're all familiar with, but having a more experience led um, experience, a much more uh, discovery led experience allows us to bundle some of these extras and these ancillary services like hotels um, uh, and like car hire in quite, quite seamlessly. And third, reduction of costs. By using CMS and DXP platforms, we can get to see huge amounts of operational efficiencies um, by reducing the, uh, the burden and the management of content and maximizing the reuse of content, which again uh, is, is very, very important, especially when translating content. The last thing you want to do is manage multiple translations in multiple different places. And modern DXP and, and CMS platforms such as .CMS uh, that use a headless approach really, really encourage this reuse out of the box. Excellent. Thanks, Jonathan. I really do appreciate that. Stefan, excellent job. I think that was uh, some really solid content. You know, I, everyone, when you think of the airlines, it's such an easy target. You know, I think that we all focus on the, the bad customer experiences we have. But, you know, uh, coming from both Stefan and Jonathan there, you know, the, the airlines are doing a good job, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And so I think that I took a lot away from uh, what both gentlemen were talking about there. Now, before we get to the Q&A, just really quickly, let me go over, uh, you know, on Twitter, uh, we're, we've got the, uh, we're following this conversation live on Twitter right now at um, hashtag into thin air. Once again, uh, on Twitter, it is at dot CMS, that's at DOT CMS, and at uh, Dept Agency to follow all this on Twitter. Also, feel free, we've got questions coming in. Use your chat window on the right side of the screen. And let's get started here. Let's get some of these questions. Looks like we got uh, Jonathan and Stefan, we got quite a few jump balls. So what I'll do is I'll kind of go round robin and I'll let one start and then one can come back in and dovetail off of it. That's okay with you guys. Yeah, sure. Um, great. All right. So Jonathan, let me start off here with you um, because of your presentation there. Um, doo -doo -doo. You know, overall, you know, you were talking about um, uh, improving the experience. So, what technologies do you see overall at a macro level that airlines need to invest in regarding um, uh, their digital transformation? Um, from a um, from a pure kind of digital marketing service or online service point of view, um, then as I said, um, the the production and distribution of content is extremely important. And so if a airline, for example, doesn't have a way to be able to distribute content efficiently and quickly, and I think certainly um, from a, a straightforward or, or something to do now, that would be a key thing is to put a platform, a content platform, digital experience platform in place. Um, from kind of a wider technological change point of view, then. Um, 
obviously personalization technologies is very important and I think there's probably a, a lot to do in uh, in the areas of investigating things like um, chatbots, uh, conversational interfaces um, and also um, perhaps some level of uh, artificial intelligence um, for personalization features uh, and then technology is kind of a way from um, from online or digital marketing technologies would be very much focused around uh, making the um, the initial part of the the airport experience um, uh, smoother. Um, things like uh, in baggage, certainly from that next initiative report, um, the baggage experience or the baggage journey is very very important, and uh, as we heard, uh, often a source of frustration. So I think those sorts of things could be. Uh, um, could be a big uh, focus and investment for airlines. Okay. It's Stefan, this will be a nice follow-up question in regards to this. So what what is your recommendations of a sweet approach versus a best in breed approach to this yeah. technology? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, and this is not specific to, uh, to the airline industry in my opinion. I think this uh, applies to any industry uh, for digital uh, these days. I think personally uh, that uh, the days where uh, you you buy into a suite approach uh, and then try to do everything with a single vendor, uh, those days are long gone. And, and, and what I see is uh, a need for flexibility uh, with enterprises where they are able to leverage existing technology and combine that with uh, different players that are specialized in certain areas of either the marketing platform, the transactional platform, or the experience layer. Uh, so I think that best of breed uh, is, is the best approach at all times, uh, but certainly also for airlines uh, because, you know, they have complex legacy uh, systems, uh, uh, transactional systems uh, regarding, you know, reservations and, and all the logistics around that. And really focusing on an API-driven platform architecture, I think really allows for A, reuse of those existing platforms, and B, at the same time, step up and increase the uh, digital maturity uh, by incorporating uh, new and cu cutting edge uh, technology without disrupting uh, yeah, your ecosystem. So yeah, that's how I feel uh, pretty strong about it. Excellent. Jonathan, to follow back up with that, you know, you spoke uh, during your presentation uh, specifically around headless and, ex and exposing APIs. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? I mean, what, what is your preference, especially coming from the agency side? You know, there's a lot of um, uh, marketing and a lot of use case around these very large platforms from the very big uh, technology companies. What, what, in your opinion, is, is the best way for the airlines to move, an all-in-one or best-in-class, as uh, Stefan was addressing? Yeah, I mean, um, I, th I think this applies not just, again, not just to the, to the airline industry, but certainly what we are seeing uh, as a trend over the past, I would say, 12 to 18 months um, in the airline industry, but wider, um, is really um, widespread adoption of a microservice-based approach um, where the capabilities of the back-end systems, whether that be a, a content management tool, uh, whether that be a marketing automation tool, whether that be um, a transaction or reservation system tool, um, are exposed via their own APIs. Uh, and then the experience layer on top chooses which APIs to interact with. Um, Really, two benefits, um, separating the experience from the business logic and, and, and the back end, um, but also from a speed to market point of view. Uh, having separate teams work on the experience and separate teams work on the API level, microservice uh, um, uh, and the API level, means that things can, get be, uh, can be done quicker. And there's also often a separation of concerns where IT may be providing a capability in the form of a microservice, uh, but the marketing team can be more of the leaders on the uh, the experience layer, consuming all that content, to consume those uh, microservices. So definitely from a, an airline perspective, but also uh, wider across uh, many different industries at the moment. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that. 
since we're kind of talking about technology, I'll move into some of the other questions in the future of technology. Let's talk about some of the, I guess, new sexy toys that will be coming up, you know, or actually here now. And now we have to find out how to uh, incorporate them into these customer experiences. Let me come back to you, Stefan. You can start off on this one and then we'll take it back over to Jonathan. You know, what are the opportunities for artificial intelligence and machine learning in an airline uh, digital experience, you know, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah no, I think that's a, that's a good question, right? And I think, uh, I mean, uh, we both uh, alluded to that, like personalization uh, is an area where uh, particularly airlines can, can differentiate. And uh, particularly in the field of uh, personalization, uh, I think um, there's a lot uh, that can be achieved with, uh, you know, machine learning and, uh, and artificial intelligence uh, at scale to really, yeah, you know, hyper-personalize the entire experience. And that could be both off airport, you know, in flights uh, and what have you. So that's, I think, uh, uh, definitely an area where, you know, everybody's in looking into uh, anyway. Uh, but um, I also think that in the, the conversational, uh, you know, engagement that uh, Jonathan was talking about, you know, uh, things like chatbots, uh, which are, you know, AI driven uh, as well, you know, natural language uh, processing. Uh, I think those are uh, huge uh, and, and will be taking off, uh, in my opinion. And again, I mean, who wants to call an airline, right? Uh, nobody, right? I mean. If, I, if I'm really desperate, then I'm calling an airline. Uh, I mean, I recently um, you know, flew from Amsterdam to Boston through Paris, uh, lost my uh, luggage uh, for two days, uh, calling to Air France, not good, right? And which is a pity because I think there's so much uh, you can do uh, leveraging technology and make that whole experience uh, way better because the result is I'm not gonna fly through Paris ever again. Right. Um, so, uh, and uh, I must say, there are some airlines, uh, particularly uh, the one that I frequent, like you know JetBlue, who do a phenomenal job on live uh, conversations. Right, and the conversations are you know very short, but to the point, and and they really help me out. So it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, but if I do have to interact, I, I'd rather use my app uh, and and or chatbot to uh, to get uh, done what I, I need. Anything you'd like to share on that, Jonathan? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I 100% agree with uh, uh, the chatbot. Um, and certainly we're having many more conversations about the implementation of chatbots with people um, at the moment, just because the technology is seen now to be fairly mature in the natural language processing um, uh, and search uh, to be able to start to surface some of the content in that interface. Um, but from a, from a machine learning point of view, uh, being able to spot trends um, to start to um, really take personalization beyond just what a particular individual told me, but looking at the trends of similar um, individuals, for example, in the airline uh, could be, you know, um, other business travelers who fly from a particular airport uh, on a Monday morning. Um, if we can start to use machine learning to um, get some insights into common behaviors, then we can start to personalize and predict um, what their behavior is going to be or start to influence their behavior um, or change their behavior um, uh, from, from those insights. Um, these are things which would uh, be far too laborious for people to do manually, uh, or certainly far too time consuming, but you know, create some algorithms, get the machine learning algorithms running at it, then uh, it can be done in real time. So taking some of that kind of travel agent um, um, friendly um, service uh, based on similar people, similar locations, and be able to scale that up, uh, I think that's the level of personalization we get to. Excellent, thank you. Here we go. Another another jump ball here. Um, I think Jonathan uh, was going down this path, so I'm going to let him take this one first. Stefan, how is IoT transforming the digital experience for the airline industry? Yeah, yeah. So um, from an IoT perspective, as I said, there's 
from from those industry reports and analysis um, the, and from uh, from our own uh, experiences, then certainly the baggage um, experience can be much improved. Um, that's often the pain point. Um, and I think using IoT devices where um, your bag can be connected, can report its status or location, um, uh, then small things like that can have a, a massive impact. So I think Internet of Things, uh, which can track people's movements uh, or uh, items' movements, not just from actually not just from a passenger perspective, but also from a cargo perspective, um, could have quite wide-ranging impl uh, implications long-term um, for improving the customer experience. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Stefan, anything you'd like to add uh, coming from the technology side? Yeah, absolutely, and I fully agree with uh, Jonathan there. Uh, there's two things where I think uh, IoT uh, can help. Uh, first of all, in-flight screens, right? Uh, I gave that little example, silly example, about, hey, you know who I am, you know where I sit, so why don't you address me uh, accordingly? Uh, should be relatively easy, right? It's just a touch point in my in-flight experience, so being able to expose uh, content that's relevant uh, for me on that screen is hardcore IoT, in my opinion. And then secondly, and this, this could be part of the whole uh, buying experience, is uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, uh, where you basically uh, yeah, augment uh, an experience. That's where you can expose, obviously, uh, content uh, as well. So. To me, those are two great examples where IoT uh, can uh, enhance the experience. Excellent, thank you. Let's see here, man, I really like these questions. I'm a, I'm a tech geek and I, I love uh, some of these questions here. And it looks like we probably, why don't we, this final jump ball here, and I'll go back to Stefan to start this one, then Jonathan, you can, you can finish it up. As facial recognition transforms from a security application to a customer experience tool, have airlines begun to adapt accordingly? I haven't seen it yet. I mean, uh, you can obviously uh, leverage uh, that technology uh, when you want to enter your airline app, right? That could be, you know, an application of. Uh, facial recognition. I haven't seen it yet, but this, this is the one that comes uh, top of mind uh, for me personally. Um, I'm a frequent flyer, so I use uh, one of those, uh, you know, Border Patrol uh, apps, not Global Entry, but uh, a Dutch one. Mm -hmm. uh, so where you basically leverage, you know, uh, biometrics uh, to uh, pass the line. Uh, but that has nothing to do with the airline, uh, obviously. But yeah, to me, the next step could be you know, I leverage facial recognition when it's a little bit more mature, uh, passing uh, borders. So, yeah, that, that's my take on uh, on facial recognition. Thanks, Stefan. And I'll let you uh, wrap us up here, Jonathan. What do you think of uh, implementing facial recognition into the overall airline customer experience? Any any last thoughts? Yeah, well, yeah I, I remember um, it's a couple of years ago now, but Virgin Atlantic were trialing at Heathrow Airport uh, with Google Glass. Uh, so they're frequent flyers. So as you walked up to the check-in desk, um, uh, sort of a member of staff had the Google Glass on, and uh, the idea was to start to do facial recognition to recognize their frequent flyers as they're walking towards them. So by the time they get to the desk, all the information's already up, and so that they can start by greeting them with a name, uh, knowing some of their preferences, knowing where they're flying to, and all that sort of thing. Now, obviously, uh, kind of Google Glass um, wasn't as popular <laughs> Uh, I think as Google wanted it to be. Um, but I can see similar applications um, happening to augment the the experiences of uh, check-in staff um, in the not-so-distant future. Uh, and I think applications where it is providing a personalization tool, um, recognizing your top customers and allowing you to give a more personal service, I think that's probably where the first area where the airlines will start to take it.